After 10 countries and four months on the road, Spencer Conway is 16,000 kilometers into his attempt to circumnavigate Africa on a motorcycle. He's endured a near fatal shooting and some of the world's toughest roads, but has experienced the diversity of Africa, from its deserts to its savannas and the people who live in this vast continent. He's now in Mozambique on the east coast of Africa as he heads south for Cape Town, the halfway point of his adventure. Okay, I got through the Mozambique border without any problems, took about 15 minutes. I've been driving about 45 minutes into Mozambique and I've just come across a typical Mozambican village, I presume. As you can see, it's very green, very beautiful, but overcast today. And I've been joined by the Mozambican villagers. And they all are. I just realised something today. I've really just been pushing it to get from uh, London to Cape Town because down the East Coast is what everybody does. Well, not what everybody does, but it just doesn't seem as important to me because Charlie Borman and Ewan McGregor have done it and quite a few people have done it, so there's nothing really new. The real challenge for me is going to be the West Coast and I guess I'm going to do a lot more coverage then, so we'll see how it goes. Spencer's route through Mozambique from the Malawi border crossing at Zobwe will take him through the interior to Chimoy. He will then follow the main highway along the coast to the capital, Maputo. From there, he plans to cross the border into Swaziland and then on to South Africa. But first, he needs to cross the mighty Zambezi River at Tet. I'm in a tank called Tete, waiting for the bridge to open. Uh, it's seven o'clock in the morning. Just uh, gonna see this whole load of motorbikes, whole load of people, looks like they're doing roadworks. Hoping for an early start, but didn't get one. I don't know how many more close shows I'm gonna have on this trip. I just killed a kid outright. Not a, not a child, a goatlet. I went all over the place like this. About five or six times swerving, I thought, oh my I'm coming off and this is going to be horrible. And I pulled it together. What a god, eh? Can you believe it? Anyway, it's another close shave. Going to be a few more, I'm sure there are. Spencer may be a god, but that doesn't protect him from having to endure some rough nights in Mozambique's low budget accommodation. I didn't really get any sleep last night. Um, too many mosquitoes and too hot. Heading off to Inhambam, I'm onto the coast of Mozambique today. I've got 500 and something kilometers to go. Yeah, this is uh, the room and I'll show you the loo. Morning, it's uh, seven o'clock in the morning and I've been riding for about an hour and I've just seen a sign which says 819 kilometers to Maputo, which is the capital of Mozambique. So no big deal there. I could do that in two days if I wanted to, but I'm just going to check out the coast. I just saw some massive potholes. They can cause serious problems because even if you don't come off, if you hit them, it can ruin your rim and that affects the spokes and then the spokes can start snapping and fall off and the wheel can fall off and you can die. Okay, no, not that serious, but you can get injured. So, you know, take these things seriously. Um, I just come across a bridge. It's very, very slippery. It's uh, made of sheet steel and obviously it had dew on it. So uh, another hazard you have to watch out for. And also about 10 minutes earlier, there were a whole load of baboons. So you've got to be careful of those things and sunburn. Don't forget about that because that's a constant problem here. Unfortunately, Spencer started to get problems with his camera, so he couldn't record any footage of the Mozambique coast. He makes it to Maputo without any further problems, where he gets his camera fixed and enters the small country of Swaziland. Swaziland only has a population of just over one million, and is a bit smaller than Wales. It gained independence from the British in 1968, and is a monarchy. Um, morning, I'm in Milwani, which is a game reserve in Swaziland, and it's basically it's run by a guy called Ted Riley. Now, this used to have uh, big game in it, but unfortunately it's surrounded by a lot of urban area, and uh, there were a lot of poachers, so what they've done is they've moved them all up, but it's still a really, really pretty place. 
It's got all the small things like ostriches, warthogs, impalas, that kind of business. What Ted Riley did was he started this place well, more than 40 years ago, and he was the first guy that really got an anti-poaching bill to come through the government. And it really meant, basically, that they could shoot anyone uh, who was caught poaching, which I kind of agree with, because you don't want to feed, you know, this Chinese market for rhino horn or whatever it is, just uh, for something as absurd as that and then losing your wildlife. One of these little hoop things is for per animal. So I mean, if you can just imagine, we're running along here as I am, it's pretty unbelievable. Anyway, that gives you some sort of idea what they're fighting against. Not a good thing, is it? OK, it's time for me to move on to South Africa. Right, I'm in a place called Bethlehem. I'm about 300 kilometers from uh, Bloemfontein, and it's all going well, except I noticed something with my front wheel. As soon as I got up, within riding, within five minutes, I knew there was something wrong. I checked it, and I had a slow puncture, so I had to sort that out. You can feel it. You get to know your bike so well, even if there's just like a slight change. That's the great thing about uh, adventure riding, is that you do become one with the bike. Spencer is taking the most direct route across South Africa to Cape Town. After crossing the border and making it to Bethlehem, he will travel through Bloemfontein, Carlsberg, and cross the Karoo Desert to Cape Town. It's 1,700 kilometers, and he's planning to do it in two days. However, even on perfect roads, there are still hazards. As well as um, very, very, very fast drivers throughout Africa, there's also animals to contend with. And I think I might have mentioned before that I hit a, a goat. I nearly came off the bike. I'll just show you what we've got here, which could have been a bit, even a bit more of a hazard. OK, I've broken my own golden rule and I've decided to carry on riding. I've done 700 kilometres since this morning, but I've decided to do another 200 because uh, oh, the light's so beautiful and I want to get to a place called Colesburg, which means I've only got 800 k's to Cape Town. Spencer makes it to Colesburg and the next day he enters the Karoo Desert. But it turns out to be an unexpectedly strange experience for this seasoned traveller. There's something about riding in the Karoo Desert that is really disconcerting. I don't know what it is, really. I've been um, in the Libyan Desert, I've been in the Egyptian Desert, but there's a different vibe here. It's sort of a, a vibe of death. Uh, it's, just, it's so hot, it's just scrubland. Uh, there are a few trucks coming by, but not many at all, and I don't feel that comfortable here. I'm just thinking all the time that I might run out of fuel. Despite his paranoia about running out of fuel, South Africa proves to be the least challenging leg of his trip. Although Cape Town signifies the halfway point of Spencer's journey, he now faces 20,000 kilometers up the west coast back to England, through some of the continent's most difficult and notorious countries. OK, I finally arrived in Cape Town, which means I'm halfway towards my mission, but uh, it's kind of an anticlimax, really, because all the way along, I was planning a big speech on what I was going to say, but I, as far as I'm concerned, I feel as though I've done the easy bit and the difficult bits to come. Just to put it in a nutshell, give you a few facts, I've driven 23,500 kilometers. Now, majority of people, they estimate from Cairo to Cape Town is about 10,000 kilometers. Uh, that just gives you some idea of how much off-road riding I've been doing as well. So. It's been incredible. I've been through 14 different countries, which is 28 borders. The plan from now is to leave Cape Town and to head up to a place called Springbok, which is close to the border with Namibia. Then it's going to be Namibia, Angola, DRC, Gabon, Cameroon. And then from there, it's going to be a case of really just working out which country you can get into and which ones you can't.
Cape Town to Springbok is about 600 kilometers and is a straightforward road. Spencer makes good time and arrives before sunset. Booked into this guest house called Catnap. I don't know why it's called that, but it's a very nice place. The woman was a little bit strange. Uh, as soon as I arrived, she said, no drink, no drugs, no women. But then after that, she was friendly in her own sort of way. It cost 120 rand, which is, seems to be standard for dormitories in um, South Africa. Um, the basic setup is you've got this long room. She called it a barn. I'd call it a warehouse, but uh, set up all these beds along the side. Don't need blankets because actually when I arrived here, it was, it was cooling down a little bit and it was 42 degrees. You've got a cooker. Um, you've got a, a, a fridge, and a fridge very, very important, obviously, because it's so hot. And uh, washing up area and loads of utensils. So it's, it's kind of a stop-off point to Namibia, which is where I'll be heading tomorrow. 149 kilometers to the Namibian border, 800 kilometers to Windhoek. So quite excited about seeing Namibia. Safely through the Namibian border, there's an immediate change of scenery and road conditions. Spencer's destination is the spectacular Fish River Canyon. But first, he picks up a friend and fellow traveler. Uh, met Carl on the junction to this place, which is uh, Fish River Canyon. Well, it's the bottom end of it, so it's not the main canyon section. But it was 80 kilometers of dirt road, and I've never seen weather like it. It started pouring with rain. So consider this. We've got the bike, we've got my luggage, we've got Carl perched on top of my luggage with a rucksack on, and me with his big rucksack on the front of the bike, on, on the tank, so pretty hectic. And basically the side of the road turned into a complete river, and then they had rivers crossing it at junctions. Luckily we managed to get a little bit of footage, so it ended up here. Going to try and take a hike tomorrow, see if we can get into the canyon. If not, we're going to leave on the bike and try and get up to the northern section of it and see what we can do over there. But brilliant, brilliant day, and the bike, obviously, as usual, made it. It's about quarter to seven in the morning, and it's, well, it must be about 25 degrees. The guard, when we arrived here, so that it gets up to about 52 degrees at this time of year. It's incredibly hot, but I like it like that. When I was in Malawi, I made friends with one of the local guys, and the night that I left, he, he came up and gave me a T-shirt. But unfortunately, because of lack of space, I've got to get rid of his T-shirt. So just for posterity, to put all the countries there. So I'm going to use it to check the oil on my bike, and then unfortunately it has to go in the bin. But it was a nice gesture anyway. So going to head on now. It's only about 50 kilometers. Weather's perfect, so not going to face the torrential rain did yesterday. So it should be a nice, peaceful trip. Having Carl on board allows them to capture more of Africa's stunning scenery on camera as the duo make their way through Namibia. I'm sitting on the edge of the Fish River Canyon, probably the most spectacular diary cam that I've done so far. The Fish River Canyon is in the south of Namibia, and obviously we're in the national park here. It's basically 145 kilometers long. At places, it's 50 kilometers wide, and the Fish River has gouged out this canyon to a depth of about 550 meters in certain places, so it's a really spectacular place. Plan now is to head up to a, pla a place called Keetmans Hoop, which is in um, central Namibia, and it's famous for having a very, very large baobab forest. Namibia has the second lowest population density in the world because most of the country is desert. Although it's independent now, in 1884 it became a German colony, and in some areas German is still spoken today. In a place called Cape Manshuop, this is an amazing place. It's called Quiver Tree Forest. Uh, quiver trees are, well, they're called kokaboom in Afrikaans, but they're amazing things. We're going to show you in a minute. 
situation is this guy's got a farm. Um, it's not really a farm, it's a sort of guest house, that sort of thing, and a camping site. But he's got cheetahs, and uh, he has about six of them. One of them is lying a couple of hundred metres from here. We filmed it earlier, but it got attacked by a warthog, which I find surprising. I didn't even realise it would be that way around. I thought the cheetah would come out best. But he's been lying there for the last two days, but amazingly beautiful creature. Um, also, these quiver trees, uh, this is what they call a quiver tree forest, but you must bear in mind that we're in a desert. So if you're thinking of forest, don't imagine it to be a forest. It's a few trees, but it's really, really stunning. About 50 degrees today, so really, really hot, completely sunburned. And we're lucky enough to be uh, camped over here, so you can see, I mean, you can't, you can't get a much better campsite than this. Isn't that pretty? With that background, uh, they've obviously, because it's Namibia, Namibia's very organised, so they've got all the facilities that you need, but it's still like being in the bush, which is really great. They've got toilets and showers, uh, bry area, like most of Southern Africa, very, very organised, but a really, really good spot. It's been a strange day and not a good one, really. Spoke to my family yesterday. Spoke to my girlfriend and my two girls and uh, my parents, and it made me a little bit depressed. Even though I've only been away four months, just over four months, uh, it brought it home to me how much I miss them. But I mean, I took on this project, so I've got to put up with it. The bad news is that uh, I have a small cut on my foot, but it's become infected. And I don't know if you can make out, my foot's gone a funny color and it's a different size to that one. I can't really bend my toes. They've all swollen up, so that's not good news. So I'm gonna have to go to hospital when I get to Vintook. The other thing is, which I'm very sad about, is that, well, I had my riding boots and I've had them through 15 countries now. Um, I've loved these boots and, well, they got a bit damaged in Ethiopia and I got a tailor to fix them, but then I got to stay in a container in Kenya um, at this truck workshop and they had a whole load of dogs and when I woke up in the morning my boots were missing and the dogs had attacked them so I think I'm gonna have to throw them away it's a very sad day for me apart from that I have reached somewhere which is pretty cool Tropic of Capricorn and my bike so I mean that's a bit of a milestone With a big foot and crying about a pair of boots, Spencer and Carl make the 400-kilometre journey to Windhoek, the capital. Here, they hope to obtain their visas for the next countries and treatment for Spencer's big foot. Planning to go from here up to uh, the Skeleton Coast to do some desert riding and some filming there. So that's going to be really excellent. Now, the problem is that we're trying to get visas to go to Angola and DRC. Luckily, we got a visa for the DRC uh, almost immediately. It should be here in the next two days. The visa for Angola was a bit of a problem. We went there. The guy, the official behind the desk, said no, basically. So what we did was we went to the British High Commission and we managed to get this. Now, this is an official letter from the High Commissioner, which means the Angolan High Commissioner is going to be phoning us here at the Backpackers and arranging visas for us. On top of that is the fact that the British High Commission have also agreed to help us all the way through Africa. It's not just with visas, but if we have any trouble, any hassles, then we'll be able to sort that out. In high spirits after receiving a British High Commission Freedom Pass, Spencer and Carl deviate from a direct route to Angola and head off to explore Namibia's famous skeleton coast. I've just stopped the bike because I've just, uh, kind of like a thunderbolt, realised how incredibly lucky I am to be doing this. It's absolutely amazing. I mean, I've been through 15, 16 countries. I've got another 18 to go. I mean, I'm not even halfway in it. It's, it's just been phenomenal. Uh, obviously, the shooting uh, put a real dampener on everything, but in a sense, I'm even luckier now because I'm experiencing these things. I'm not dead. And on top of that, uh, the interest from people and the support has been incredible. I've got some sort of weird obsession. <laughs> 
with my boots. So the ones that I said I was going to throw away, I didn't. I splashed out 30 US dollars, and this guy fixed them amazingly. Look at that. The Skeleton Coast name derives from whale and seal bones that once littered the coastline from the whaling industry. In modern times, it's littered with shipwrecks caused by offshore rocks and fog. But it's also home to some amazing wildlife. I'm up in uh, Cape Cross. It's one of the biggest Cape fur seal uh, communities in the world. Uh, I'm actually quite stunned and don't really know what to say. I've never seen anything like it before. You can see the different colorings. The darker black ones, they happen to be pups. Uh, the mating season's around December period, so they're generally three to four months old at this stage. Most of the deaths that occur, occur during the first six weeks, but obviously they're not having a problem here. Uh, there's a stench, but that's obviously because there's so many of them. But just have a look. With the stench of seal breath in their nostrils, Spencer and Carl leave the Skeleton Coast and head for Oshikango, the border town with Angola. OK, we're 200 kilometres from the border with Angola. We've had quite a funny <laughs> evening. Uh, we're actually filming from a toilet. Uh, Carl's eating some bry that uh, we started, and then we went into the... It's kind of like a guest house, but not really. We asked for some food, but this woman said, uh, no, you can't have any food. And she was incredibly rude, and she basically told us, if you wanted to go camping, then we need to know that it's going to rain sometime, and you may as well go and eat under the stoop outside, which is like a little enclosure outside this toilet. So we just decided that we would come in. So anyway, here's, here's the scene. <laughs> See, it's, very, it's quite smart. We managed to find some chairs, and we got a bottle of red wine, and this is basically our place for the night, if it doesn't stop. Damn it. It's from the storm. After a night in the toilet, sheltering from the weather, Spencer picks up his bedraggled bike, packs up his soaking tent, and heads for the Angola border. Little did he know this was going to be the last footage of this leg of the journey. Africa Tax was about to bite. <laughs> <laughs> 